All right, I've got 10 minutes here to launch into uh, 2D Fourier transforms, right? We, we got the whole, you know, we got the whole, um, uh, we got the whole downward continuation problem wired, you know? We can do it, we can accomplish those examples that I showed you earlier, you know, where I downward continued a synthetic wave field and showed you that I can reconstruct the model, the, the structures, okay, from the, and collapse all the uh, diffraction hyperbolas, okay? That's what we want to do. Um, but there's some, some practical considerations, okay? Um, and and uh, it comes in this essential first step of putting the 2D data into the, uh, uh, into the Fourier domain, doing the 2D Fourier transform. How do we do a 2D Fourier transform? Okay? I, did, you know, I skipped over the, uh, the, uh, uh, the page on that in the first part of the class, and, um, and we're going to get to it here. All right? Our, um, so that, that 2D wave equation, that 2D Fourier transform is, criti is critical. And you know, for a lot of our data sets, it's pretty easy to do. Okay? Once, you know, I'll, show you, I'll show you how to do it right. Okay? And, and you could set up a very simple code that would, that would do it right. And it would work for most, uh, most sections. But when you get to 3D data, or even you get to 2D data ex as extensive as uh, Amy Isis's uh, chirp surveys or Gretchen's chirp surveys, okay, from Lake Tahoe, and I Isis's were from Pyramid Lake, okay, those have hundreds of thousands of traces, and each trace is, you know, has uh, uh, maybe 10,000 data points, okay. So we're going to run, run into some problems with data sizes, all right. And uh, so I, I need to explain to you not only how to do a 2D Fourier transform correctly, but also uh, how to do it fast in the case of, of you know, how, how to not have it bogged down. Okay. And that's, uh, so the, the essential uh, part of that, the essential insight, uh, no, the solution to the essential insight is essentially, is basically a card trick. And that card trick is something that I will do uh, for you uh, the next time we meet, which is going to be Tuesday the 13th, I think it is. Um, so hopefully I'll remember to bring, um, to bring a deck of cards. Um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a very nicely Nevada solution, right? <laughs> uh, but it's really just a very simple card trick. Uh, but it's il illustrative of, of, you know, a very important uh, solution in computational science as well. Okay, so um, we have the, the 2D uh, Fourier transform, okay, uh, here written in continuous form. You know, we're transforming a fu some function, like our service uh, 2D uh, zero offset data, from x and t to kx and omega, all right? Now, of course, uh, we're going to drop the one over two pi scale factor. Okay, we're going to drop the infinite limits. Um, when we go to the uh, the discrete Fourier transform, you know these change anyway, and so you know we're not going to let those get in our way. We we have to figure out later how to uh, have the appropriate scale factors. Okay. Uh, the other thing here is I can't just assign small letters to functions in the physical domain. And capitals to their Fourier duals in the in the Fourier domain, okay? Because we've got you know all these mixed objects we've looked at like capital P of omega kx, but z, okay, still in the physical domain. So you know whatever whatever whether I do a small letter or a, or a, or a capital letter for the 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 multidimensional field, you got to look at the arguments, okay? So I'm going to try to keep the arguments in here so that you can always see you know what's been done to it. Okay, for the sign convention, uh, as I've said before, we're choosing the convention of physicists, which is the opposite to that of electrical engineers. Okay, electrical engineers have the sign of the spatial transform be the same as the sign of the tra time transform because they're worried about waves collapsing onto antennas, um, and uh, and that's that's kind of their prototype problem. We're worried about waves, you know, uh, coming out from explosions. Okay, so we need we need that uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, fix that sign convention. Um, 
So our waves are, are going to propagate positively on any spatial axis as, as time uh, goes, as time increases. Okay, our reflectors explode. And so that we are going to require the sign on the spatial frequencies, however many we have, to be opposite the sign on the temporal frequency. We only have one time axis, right? Uh, at least I hope. Even, even superstring theory, right, it, it has 16 or 23 spatial dimensions, but only one time dimension. So at least we, we have that sim simpl simplicity. Okay. Um, so we'll let the time axis have the positive sign in the forward Fourier transform, and then here's the the uh, signs. Here's the exponentials, the Fourier exponentials for the, the spatial axes, and on the inverse Fourier transform, we'll let the the time axis take the negative Fourier transform. Of course, electrical engineers write Fourier transform software, and they design processors that do Fourier transforms. So, you know, we may have to take the complex conjugate of the of the Fourier transform data. Okay. Now, in most in most software, the electrical engineers write. They allow that. You, know, you, you tell them whether, whether you want this done with a positive or a negative sign. Okay. But sometimes not. Um, and so we've got to watch it. Okay. The factors under the integrals are all separable. Okay. So here's our, our 2D Fourier transform. Note, we can do the Fourier transform from time to omega, from time to frequency, first. We can do that whole Fourier transform. We can we can uh, write it out to a uh, uh, to a CD and and mail it to our friend in uh, uh, in, in uh, Dubai and and he can he can do the transform from x to kx you know the next month. Okay, it's totally separable. All right, and and you can see that here in the uh, in the uh, in the just in the algebra. Okay, so what's in the square brackets here? Okay. Is the Fourier the partially Fourier transformed data? Uh, it's still in X, but it's it's been transformed from in one dimension only from time to omega. Okay, and then we need to finish the job. And also, we can we can do it the other way around. Okay, we can transform it from X to KX. You know, put it put it in a drawer. Come back uh, next year and and finish transforming it. Uh, from uh, time to omega. Okay, it doesn't matter which way we do; we'll get this exactly algebraically the same result. It's not an approximation. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, uh, note that uh, uh, each directional transform, you know, from from t to omega, or from kx to x, from x to kx, it's just a one-dimensional Fourier transform in different directions over the 2D function. All right. So here, uh, uh, and and maybe this is a little weird because I'm I'm going to plot this with time going to the right. So maybe this will make more sense to the earthquake seismologists. And then x is going to go down. Okay. So here's our original our original data, which we'll just consider a matrix. Okay. So Let's just say, all right. First, we're going to Fourier transform um, from time to omega, right? And time is the is is varying along the rows of this matrix. Okay, this is a you know two D matrix in the in the computer, and so the you know we we take every time row, right, and we Fourier transform that. Okay, and then to finish the job, to Fourier transform from x to kx. We take every column, you know, which is how x varies, and we Fourier transform those. So if I have, you know, here, uh, uh, if I have a thousand uh, seismograms, right? Each seismogram is is one of these rows of time. Then I I'm doing a thousand one D Fourier transforms. If I have ten thousand um, uh, time points, right? Then each of these columns, I'm going to have ten thousand columns that vary in x, okay? And and I'm going to have to transform each of those. You know, I'm going to make I'm going to do ten thousand uh, trans uh, uh, one dimensional transforms from x to kx, okay? So I think this is where I'll uh, I'll leave it here. Um, you know. Uh, 
basically, uh, if you have nt times nx, the number of Fourier of 1D Fourier transform calls, you know, subroutine calls, say required, right, is going to be um, is going to be first to go from time to to uh, to omega. You got to have nx number of Fourier transforms run, right? And then to go from x to kx, you got to have nt number of, of Fourier transforms run on nt columns. Okay, so that's how it is going to kind of stack together. Okay, okay, we've been exploring the two-dimensional uh, Fourier transform, and uh, we'd already learned about uh, in the first half of the class about the one-dimensional fast Fourier transform. So we know we have that as a tool. And this two-dimensional Fourier transform is essentially guidance on just how do you use, how do you call your 1D fast Fourier transform subroutine and accomplish by, via that a 2D Fourier transform. So um, we uh, had looked at this uh, before. Um, you know, here it is in, uh, in continuous form. And uh, you can see that it's really an independent uh, Fourier transform, an independent integral over, uh, over x, and an independent integral over time. And, but one is buried inside the other. Okay? So um, you know, once we, went, we explored the sign convention and why our sign convention is different from the sign convention of the electrical engineers who have tended to write uh, Fourier transform software. Uh, we discovered that if we embed one inside the other, so you know, really uh, this expression here says first we Fourier transform all of the, um, uh, along the, the spatial x direction. No, I'm sorry. First we Fourier transform along the time Direction from t to omega, and we take the output of that, you know, one seismogram at a time, one time time trace at a time uh, um, Fourier transform. We take the output of that, and then look, it's buried underneath this um, uh, this transform, which goes from x to k sub x, the uh, the uh, spatial wave number. Okay. You can see that uh, that exponential here is e to the power of i times k sub x times x. Okay, and it's integrating over dx. Um, you know, I, when you first look at this, you know, how do you accomplish this uh, this two D Fourier transform at the top here? And by the way, we're on uh, notes eighteen, page thirty nine. Uh, when you first look at that, you say, you know, what do I do? Do I first transform it in time? Uh, and then I take the original data and transform it at x, and I add the two together. No, it's a, it's a, it's more of a, uh, a chained process. Okay, uh, as it should be, right? If you, if you were to break down these integrals, right? You could see that the form of this is that you do the, the transform in one direction first, and you use the output of that one-dimensional Fourier transform as your input to the Fourier transform in the other direction. Okay. The the transforms that are done independently are the uh, you know there these are uh, uh, let's say first we we Fourier transform from x to omega okay and uh, I'm sorry from t to omega from time to frequency and so uh, and time is is on the horizontal axis here okay x is on the vertical axis so we first Fourier transform the the first seismogram. Uh, from um, from t to omega, then the second seismogram from t to omega, then the third size third seismogram. So if we have you know twenty seismograms, there's going to be twenty one dimensional Fourier transforms from t to omega. Then we pick out each column here in this representation, okay, which which is how it varies in x. And then for every uh, every time level, right? So we have you know the zero time, one times d, one times uh, dt, two times dt, three times dt, right? So these are like rows of 
uh, rows of x, you know, varying x at one constant time. Um, and, and for that, we have to uh, transform. Uh, we got to pull out that row. And, and remember, that's already been transformed from time to omega. We left it, we transformed it, and we left it back in place. Okay, we just plopped, we did the transform, we plopped it right back where it came from. Um, and so now we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to do it along the, the uh, columns, and we're going to transform it from, we're, taking, we're going to pick up the, uh, the, the time to omega transformed output of the first step, and we're going to, um, we're going to transform it from x to kx, and then we're going to put it back in that row. And that's done. Okay? And if there's a thousand time steps, then there's going to be a thousand one-dimensional uh, fast Fourier transforms from x to kx. Okay. So, uh, uh, and that's what this is explaining here. You know, first we successively, or or maybe uh, you know, in parallel, you can hand off each of these Fourier transforms to uh, um, to another. Uh, you know, to, to one uh, uh, core of the GPU, right, uh, or or one processor. You could, uh, if it's a really big one, you could send it to uh, uh, a cluster in California, and and you could send, you know, you could send the first thousand rows to a cluster in California. You could send the next thousand rows to a cluster in Massachusetts, and uh, you can do it completely in in parallel that way. Okay, the thing that that's hard to do, but it's been solved now. Is is you know if you have a really big you know like million or billion length uh, um, vector you know how do you fast Fourier transform that and that that took thirty years to solve that problem um, to do that in parallel um, so uh, uh, but the parallelization of the two D Fourier transforms easy because there's so many one D Fourier transforms okay so uh, you know first one direction then the other. And remember, it doesn't matter which way we do it first; we get exactly the same result. Okay. So, uh, uh, just a, a mention: we're going to talk about separately separability later. Uh, and um, you know, the fact that I can, uh, you know, I could have a cluster in in uh, the UK do all the time to omega Fourier transforms, and then I could, you know, use a file file transfer uh, code and transfer the result of that to uh, a cluster in New Zealand and have them do the, uh, uh, the x direction uh, transforms, right? That means that the processes are totally separable. Okay? You still need to chain the output you know, into the input of the, of the second step, but you, know, you can do that uh, via snail mail if you had to. You know, one run doesn't, um, doesn't depend on the other running at the same time. Okay? So uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very nice uh, separability, uh, and that brings a lot of computational benefits. And it's a result of the, uh, the linear nature of the Fourier transform. Okay? Just the fact that uh, uh, in doing this, you know, we could, we could, I could put these, these uh, square brackets around the time transform. And and uh, and completely separated out. I don't have a term which is e to the i uh, x times t, right? There's no there's no uh, or or t times omega. Uh, I'm sorry. There's no term that's uh, k x times omega. No, there's no cross terms like that. So I can separate out. You know, algebraically, I can completely separate out this. Uh, um, this uh, term here, uh, this you know one-dimensional Fourier transform. Okay, so the algebra gives the uh, the separability. We'll talk more about separation of calculations uh, later on. Becomes really important as we move to three D calculations, right? Um, because then with three D data sets, we really want we we might really want to accomplish you know one uh, one set of computations in the field, the next set. In one processing center and the next set in, in a different processing center, you know, for for practical reasons. Okay. Um, now this is uh, no trouble, you know, all the data sets you'll work with or the the synthetic examples you have in the lab exercises. Uh, this all works just fine, but 
um, even now we have trouble with certain data sets. Okay, and that's because of the way that that matrices are are uh, you know two dimensional objects like like this uh, uh, zero offset uh, seismic section. Uh, the way two-dimensional objects are are represented in the computer as an as an image, you know, an image is a matrix is a uh, uh, is a is a set of vectors, um, you know. But but all of that is a is a virtual construction. Computer memory just starts at you know location zero, and then goes up to the maximum you know disk space you have or the maximum RAM you have. Okay, so there will be, you know, out here will be uh, uh, location, uh, uh, you know, the location at uh, uh, five terabytes or whatever the size of your disk is. Okay, so uh, uh, and it just counts, you know, it just has one index. Okay, um, yeah, you, it's it's broken up. Uh, you know, each program has its own space. Uh, uh, each app has its own space. Uh, you know, each operating system has its own space. Uh, it's all parceled up, and and matrices are are parceled up in the same way. So let's say that I had uh, three traces, and each one had three time points, and so they'd have uh, addresses one, two, three, and then I get to the next trace. That's going to turn out to have addresses four, five, six, and then the third trace will have addresses seven, eight, nine. Okay. And so what the computer is really doing is it's representing this three by three matrix as one nine element vector, and computer memory is always you know a one D vector. Um, I wonder if there's been any experimentation about uh, truly two D computer memory. I suspect not, but it would be an interesting interesting thing to explore. So we have our two D uh, our two D zero offset uh, record. Um, <clears throat> our, sec our data section, our wave field, and it's in T and X. And then we, uh, you know, for, so first, you know, generally we'll Fourier transform it from uh, time to omega, uh, time to frequency, uh, and and that's along the vectors. And so we're, you know, we're picking out these these places that are near each other, right? The green one is all one seismogram. The blue one is one seismogram. The red one is all one seismogram. Okay, they're they're nearby, okay, and and but the, we run into trouble when we want to uh, we want to go the other way, okay. So here we're uh, you know we've already transformed from t to omega. We want to transform from x to kx, okay. So what do we got to do? We got to pick out. Let's say we're going to work on this vec this column here, okay. We got to we got to pick out uh, you know if it's four by four that's you know. That's four, eight, twelve, you know, sixteen. Um, all right, and we gotta we gotta flip that up into a you know make it not a column vector but a, a regular a regular vector in memory, okay, a regular array, and we put it through our Fourier transform subroutine, and it kicks out a regular array. And then we gotta put it back in to the matrix, okay. So if there's you know uh, a billion um, if there's a billion time points per seismogram, then there's you know uh, this, and maybe there's a thousand traces, right? Then we're going to have um, we're going to have memory locations for this one column that are separated by um, by a billion minus one uh, elements that we have to skip over, okay? And if they're separated by a billion elements, then they're not going to be sitting in uh, in in the computer memory all at once. Okay. By the time we you know skip up to the second one or the third one, then it's going to be buffered out to disk. The computer you know the 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 computer memory is is you know it's going to fill as much RAM as it can with this uh, with this this matrix with this this data stream, but um, uh, the part that won't fit in the physical RAM has to be out on disk, okay? And so every one of these, every time you pick up one of these widely separated elements, the the mechanical head of the disk has to do a separate seek, and uh, uh, and that takes you know not not milliseconds but you know like tenths of a second, 
Okay, or maybe maybe you know in, in modern fast disks maybe a, a ten milliseconds. Okay, whereas a you know reading one element out of a out of a row, right? That'll take nanoseconds. You know if it's in if it's in RAM, it might take one or two nanoseconds. But you put it out on a disk and suddenly it takes a million times as long. Okay, so the uh, uh, you know just to assemble one of these columns into a vector is going to take. You know, a million times as long as 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 just picking out one row, and and that means that basically it's going to take forever. You know, for this even for this billion by thousand um, uh, data set, uh, which is not not exactly ridiculous anymore. Okay, it's quite realistic. Um, it's uh, it's going to take forever. Now, what we're actually doing here is. And what we need to do more efficiently is transpose the matrix. Okay, we have a, a matrix here that in, is in rows of time, and they easily get you know it's easy to pick out the rows, and and they get uh, um, they get uh, transformed to uh, uh, from t to omega, and then we do a transpose. So notice that the transpose is going to do a corner turn, okay, and that's going to make this. Uh, the horizontal axis now is x, and the vertical axis is now omega, or you know it was time. Okay, so we got to do a transpose. Then we can still then if we can accomplish that transpose, then we can we can do the uh, just picking out individual vectors. Okay, and and it's not so hard, uh, and it's going to be much faster. Um, so the key is is picking out the vectors. And I gotta, I gotta, you know, you you guys are going to encounter Fortran codes, and you're going to be working uh, also with codes that are in C, C plus plus, Java, uh, C sharp, uh, some of some of those languages. And there's a difference uh, between how um, how Fortran versus C, Java, and the others how they represent uh, the dimensions of a matrix. Okay, so let's say we have a three by four matrix M. And this horizontal direction is what I call fastest varying. If you want to address adjacent locations in memory, okay, on an inner loop, right, for most efficiency, and then you go to disk and you fetch you fetch the whole next row, right, and they're all contiguous. You're not having to skip over, right. That's called the inner loop index, okay. So here you can see there's the inner loop starts usually in our data at time, okay. And so the inner loop index would go from zero time up to the maximum time, and here it's four. You know there might be four time samples. To declare this matrix in this way, okay, with with the four elements per uh, per uh, time series per inner loop, you know, per adjacent uh, uh, time samples of a seismogram, you would declare m uh, and then open parenthesis four comma three close parenthesis. In C, it's the opposite. Okay, the the inner loop index is uh, in Fortran is close to the uh, it's on the left. It's closest to the um, uh, to the to the name of the of the variable. In C, it's the one furthest away. Okay, now you'll see in my Java codes that that I hardly ever use a two dimensional matrix. You know, I I actually um, go through and and uh, um, you know even convert to uh, you know recognizing that that uh, I always have one dimensional data in the computer you know I, I build into the into my codes the 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 recognition of, of how it's uh, how it's ar arranged okay so uh, uh, you won't see this in my codes but if you look at somebody else's code you'll see that the inner loop index, is or the and here the inner loop dimension is the last one, and the ones closest to the variable name are going to be the more outer and outer loops. You can have as many dimensions as you want. Okay, so here's a here's a Fortran code that accesses adjacent numbers in memory, right? And of course, for a three by four matrix, it doesn't matter how we do it. Okay, but when you get up to these, you know. If if the if the data set is is getting towards one gigabyte, okay, and that's very common now, even for a zero offset stack section, 
okay, or for for one of uh, Amy Isis's uh, Pyramid Lake uh, data sets. Um, if it's a gigabyte, then most computers are going to have trouble with it. It's not going to be able to stuff the whole thing into memory, okay, uh, in, into into RAM, and some of it's always going to be on disk whenever you open that that binary file, okay. So uh, uh, you know you have nested do loops here, okay. They both go to this last statement here. So this is the outer loop and this is the inner loop. Fortunately, you know that's the same structure between uh, Fortran and C and its derivatives. Um, and uh, you know so we uh, uh, the inner loop is the second one, okay. And and with C you get to uh, you get to show how uh, you know what's nested inside what. And so, you know, it enters the outer loop. It it does one whole cycle, you know, here through time, through all four time samples, and then it goes to the next. It goes back and and uh, uh, exits to the uh, the outer loop and does the next trace and its four samples. Okay. So uh, you know, in addressing the the uh, the uh, uh, the inner loop index, right. That's with the k here, and that's the closest to the variable name of, for the matrix. And, uh, and the k here is the most distant one in C. So that's a, a, that's a, a warning you know, when you're looking at other people's programs. You know, when you get to the larger data sets, you've got to pay attention to you know, where, how's the data arranged. Because okay? otherwise, you know, as soon as you get these gigabyte-sized data sets, uh, your your uh, your program could suddenly fail, you know. You you could you could run, you know, it'll run just fine up to you know maybe uh, seven hundred megabyte data sets. You know, it'll come back to you in a second, and then uh, you put in a seven hundred fifty megabyte data set, and it doesn't come back to you in uh, you know in a million seconds, which is uh, what that's like a tenth of a year or a thirtieth of a year. <laughs> That's a bit too long. That's like twelve days, okay? And that you know that happened to me. So uh, uh, okay. So the whole key to this, all right, the whole key to to accomplishing uh, the two D Fourier transform in large data sets is how to do the transpose, okay? And uh, so I read uh, I read. Clairbout's description in his book of how how to do it, and uh, he says it's basically a card trick, and I figured out the card trick. So now we're going to go to that. <laughs> All right. All right, so I have, I have my one-dimensional computer memory here. Let's lay it out and see how it looks. Okay, and... So what we've got here is uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the aces is one seismogram. The uh, uh, the twos are the next seismogram, right? And the suits always go uh, diamond, club, heart. Um, no, diamond, spade, club. Uh, diamond, spade, heart, club. Okay. So. Um, uh, now um, this is how it looks. I'm gonna I'm gonna recreate that uh, that computer memory. Okay, I was just showing you what it looks like, and it's uh, it's in that order where the the fastest varying thing is the uh, is the suit. Okay. And uh, no, no funny business this time. So uh, I will take this one-dimensional file, this vector of, of data, and I'm going to put it down into uh, into two one-dimensional files. Okay, and I'm going to do that twice because this is a four by four matrix. So this operation I'm doing right now is perfectly sequential. Uh, in most operating systems, it'll buffer just fine. Okay, and then I've got 
to put uh, this one on top and uh, so I'm concatenating the two files and I do it again. I need It's a 4x4 four four matrix so I need uh, uh, splitting out into two files twice. Did I mess it up again? You got it. Okay. And so the same thing. Now let's let's lay it out. Okay, so now you can see that the fastest varying direction is now the numbers instead of the suits. And I've effectively corner turned the matrix with all sequential operations. Okay. Nice, we have the same order too, where it's diamonds, spades, hearts, clubs. That's right, although that's uh, uh, going backwards, yeah, I think. I suppose, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and that's because I was, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't, uh, uh, the order in the computer memory was always going down in the deck, but I was piling up on the top. And that, so it was, I should have flipped the cards over. That would have kept it normal. But I accomplished the, uh, the, uh, the transpose. So that's, that's how you do it. Uh, you know, you need to, the, the prime factors of, your, of the dimensions of your matrix should go into the, um, the, the number of files you, you split up into and then how many times you, you do the splitting. So if we had, you know, 1024 by 1024, we could probably split it up into uh, you know 64 files. What would that be? 64 times, something like that. Okay. And then that's uh, uh, that's how to do it. And now I'll pick it up like this. And I have it ready for the next time. Okay, so now you know the now you know the trick. Uh, you know, implementing it in code is is not uh, not simple, but at least it allows us to take any size data set and as efficiently as we can transpose it. Okay, so that's that that's that uh, uh, that critical step. Okay, that will keep your uh, your two D FFTs from grinding to a halt. Right. So what we do, we do a uh, we have our data set uh, and, and just see the way it's ordered here. This is kind of a C order. Uh, you know, usually we have size, you know, rows of time, right? So the, the fastest varying direction is time. That, that means we have seismograms. So uh, it's called multiplexed data if, if, if it's rows of X, okay? Um, but in rows of time, we have our, uh, our initial um, data in X and T, we do a Fourier transform from T to omega. So we get in rows of omega, we our our halfway Fourier transform data set is halfway Fourier transformed data set is in X and omega. Then we do the transpose operation, okay, and that gives us our halfway transformed data set in rows of X, for which we individually extract every you know for every time step we extract every row of X. And we Fourier transform that, and uh, and then we put it back in, um, just like we did with the time. And then we have the Fourier transform now in rows of kx, okay, and also omega. And so you know to get the data back to the way we had it, we want to do another uh, uh, transpose to get it back into uh, omega, uh, rows of omega. So that would be a complete Fourier transform in two dimensions of uh, the data of the data set in uh, in X and T. Uh, so uh, we have an an n by m matrix. Okay, how many Fourier transform operations? How many Fourier transform calls to the to the Fourier transform method are we going to you know the one D Fourier transform method are we going to have to make? Okay. So uh, let's say there's uh, n uh, rows 
of each of m time points, right? So um, each uh, uh, the Fourier, Fourier transforming, uh, you know, we, we have a, a, a an m length transform for um, for each seismogram for each row of time, okay? And we got to do that n times. So we start with n calls to the uh, Fourier transform in time, okay? And then we transpose the matrix, okay? And now it's in rows n long, and uh, there are m rows after transpose, okay? So uh, the the transpose from x to kx then is going to require m calls to the to the trans to the uh, Fourier transform algorithm, the Fourier transform method, m calls, and each of those will be will be an n length transform. Okay, so the the you know from that you can figure out well how many total you know operations are required, right? Remember the each Fourier transform takes uh, uh, each fast Fourier transform takes uh, you know big N times log to the base two a, a big N. Uh, that's uh, that's how many you know kind of multiplications it takes. All right, but how many how many times do we have to run the Fourier transform uh, uh, subroutine? Well, that is N plus M, N plus M calls to do the full the two D Fourier transform. Okay, so um, uh, so we can do a a two D Fourier transform now. Uh, a few words about about um, uh, you know we haven't before we have not before Fourier transformed in the x direction, and uh, when we Fourier transformed in the time direction, I had to warn you about um, time aliasing. Okay. Now, Fourier trans since we're Fourier transforming in the x direction, I need to warn you about x direction aliasing, which is otherwise known as spatial aliasing. Okay, so all the same problems that we can that we can have um, in uh, uh, with with time um, with time aliasing, there we have them in spades. Haha, with uh, with spatial aliasing. Why is that? Because um, you know, to avoid spatial, to avoid time aliasing, all we got to do is is uh, turn up the sample rate on on our recorder, and we get larger data files, but that's no problem these days. Okay, to avoid spatial aliasing, you've got to put more recorders in the ground. Okay, so you always want to, you know, usually you have a certain distance, a certain offset that you want to uh, that you want to occupy. Or you know, say a certain length uh, for your seismic line. Okay, you got a certain prospect you want to you want to cover. And if you have uh, uh, if that prospect is um, is a kilometer wide, and you have you have a hundred channels, then you're gonna you're gonna have um, ten meters between each of each of your each of your channels. Okay, but that ten meter spacing. Could uh, could lead you to um, to spatial aliasing, and so if you if you decide you need to have uh, five meter spacing, that means you have you have to get two hundred channels, okay? And the equipment for two hundred channels costs you know at least twice as much as the equipment for hundred channels. It costs it's going to cost probably exactly twice as much to rent, but the real factor is that it's going to it's going to take you twice as long. To deploy all those channels, okay, and you need twice as much labor. All right, that's the real cost. Okay, uh, so the whole survey will take you know will take twice as long and cost twice as much. Um, you know, it's it's you know whereas if you had to avoid time aliasing by 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 turning up uh, um, just turning up the sample rate, it might not, not cost you anything. Right, because the data files are are not going to really be any more difficult to uh, to deal with, even if they're twice as large. Okay, so it's far more difficult to sample more in space than it is to sample more in time. 
Okay. So so where do we where do we see spatial aliasing? Okay. It depends. Where we see spatial aliasing depends on the apparent velocity of the waves. Okay. Um, you know, here's a here's a, an array uh, uh, laid out. You know, when let's say we're going to record uh, uh, 2D um, zero offset data. Okay. And here maybe is the the end of a of a uh, the faulted end of a piece of stratigraphy in Pyramid Lake, and we're going to run over it with a chirp survey. So this guy is going to be swimming in just a sec. All right. Um, and here's uh, uh, here's where we have our, uh, our 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 receivers. Okay. And and uh, this you know it's important for us to to find that termination, that's that stratigraphic termination because that's going to locate the fault. Okay. Now, when we when we hit, uh, you know, let's say we have a source here, and and the receivers here too, okay, we hit that uh, uh, with a um, with the source, it's going to radiate waves in all directions, okay, and some of those waves are going to be, you know, if we're recording uh, non-zero offsets, those waves are going to be propagating at a pretty good angle, a pretty good uh, a non-zero slowness p, right. If the waves are propagating straight back up, uh, and it, you know I put the arrow in kind of the wrong place, but if it's going straight up, the the slowness is zero, right? Because the the apparent velocity is infinite. These waves right above the the the, the exploding source, you know, they're arriving simultaneously at all the receivers that are right over the top of them. Okay, but over here, you know, they have a non-infinite uh, x component of their wavelength, right? The 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 wavelength has a z component and an x component. Okay. And uh, uh, and the x component is large. You know when you're away from the the source. And now even for zero offset data, right? If we had the source and receiver over here on the right. And we're trying to look at that uh, structure, that stratigraphic termination there. Okay, then it's going to be propagating at this at this large angle, and this uh, finite, uh, non-zero, uh, and larger uh, wave number, p. Okay, so um, uh, another way of looking at it is uh, is over here. Uh, this is a an offset uh, uh, gather. And we're tracking one hyperbolic reflection. Um, no, actually, uh, this this works too. Uh, this is this works as a uh, this middle one here works as a zero offset section. Okay, we're tracking one uh, one hyperbolic uh, diffraction. You know, from that structural termination, we want to reconstruct it up here. But what happens if we you know we want to we want to take its uh, its tails and collapse them into the into the top? That's what migration does. Okay, and it's going to let us see that that fault that's providing that structural interruption, or the stratigraphic structural interruption of the stratigraphy. Now, if, if all we're worried about is is the the top part of the hyperbola where it's flat, we could have a very large delta x. But if we're out here at the you know on the tail of the hyperbola at the maximum wave number, I'm sorry, the maximum uh, ray parameter, which is also the minimum apparent velocity. Right, the most tilted part, then the delta x that, that we would have to have to sample that is is much smaller. Okay, what is it? Right, we need to figure out what our minimum horizontal component of the of the uh, wavelength is. So that's lambda sub x, okay, min, and we take half of that and our because we need two spatial samples per uh, wavelength. Right, our um, uh, the the delta x the sample we have the the interval we have to use between receivers has to be less than that okay and you know then we put uh, uh, lambda through uh, you know v equals f lambda right so um, the uh, the apparent velocity in the x direction that's v sub x over two and over the maximum frequency that's uh, that's the same thing you know. Delta x has got to be less than that ratio. Okay, so the higher the velocity, the larger the delta x you can use. Okay, the less sloping this will be. 
So near the surface, you know, in low velocity, uh, you know, like lake bed, uh, delta x is going to have to be smaller. Also, notice the higher the frequency we want to recover, then the smaller delta x is going to have to be. Okay. Here's another way of saying it. Uh, you know, using uh, instead of the apparent velocity, using the the maximum ray parameter. Okay. So the, you know these are worth calculating for any any uh, uh, any survey. Um, you know we almost never have enough money to actually avoid um, spatially aliasing, but we need to know what our limits are going to be. What's the highest frequency that where we will avoid any spatially aliasing? You know even when we're away, we're out away from the spot, the exploding reflector we're trying to see. Okay, and how well are we going to be able to record properly? This um, uh, the tail of the diffraction, and and that's gonna that's gonna tell us how well we'll be able to reconstruct that structural discontinuity, and locate and how well we'll locate the fault. When we alias, then we're gonna end up with multiple images, okay, and and that's what the Fourier transform is gonna do for us, yeah, the Fourier transform in X now, okay. So this is a, a fundamental understanding of that of that two D Fourier transform. That now we have to uh, um, we're we're going to be able to apply our two D Fourier transform now to uh, to find a simple downward continuation method, and that's going to enable us with the uh, uh, the imaging condition to come up with a, a Fourier Fourier domain migration method. Okay, and that's what I'll talk about uh, tomorrow.